Welcome to The Midpoint. I'm Patrick McKenna, founder of One America Works and partner at Comeback Capital. Today, I'm joined by Jeremy Keel, co-founder and managing partner at Catalyst Opportunity Funds. Welcome, Jeremy. Thank you, Patrick. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me. Well, I'm so excited about this conversation for many reasons, uh, a couple of them quite personal that we'll get into, but you know, right off the bat, uh, we talk to a lot of founders on this program, people starting companies, they're usually software-based businesses using technology, and they're out looking for investment and you know, talking to investors. And most people don't actually think of funds, investment funds, as entities that also are founded and get started for the first time. And you're a, a founder of a, of a fund, an investment fund. So this is going to be a really fun, different way to look at the founding story. So we're really excited to, to share what you've been working on. Thank you. I'm excited. Yeah, I don't um, typically think of myself as a founder, but you're, you're right. I mean, it's a business just like any other, um, you know, capital management. So um, and there's a lot of interesting stuff that comes through the investments that we can, you know, that we can talk about. So thanks again for having me. And so we should just like put out there, you know, this is another place where we connect is I'm typically, you know, founding companies and on investing in tech companies. And, you know, we, we co-founded uh, Catalyst together uh, with a couple other with Jim Sorensen and, and Christian Peterson um, five years ago. So, you know, our, our interlocking uh, journey started together with, with Catalyst as a founding team and a founding company. And, and, and I'm really proud of all the work that you've, uh, you and the team have continued to do. So, uh, that's another thing for me to be excited about on this conversation. Well, yeah, the feeling's mutual. I, um, you know, it's special for me to be able to do this because, um, you know, you uh, you were there with me from the very beginning. I mean, you're a co-founder in this, and uh, and you've you've been a mentor for me, uh, you know, mentor to me for a long time. And so it's really uh, special for me to be able to get uh, get connected with you, reconnected with you on this. And, and I've also watched the growth of One America Works, I have to say, um, in the meantime, and just sort of seen how you've been able to, you know, get into these communities in the heartland and, and make connections across the coast and, and just all the amazing stuff you've been able to do. So um, success story on both fronts, I think. Well, I appreciate that. And, you know, so let, let's, uh, you know, this is a really great place to kind of kick it off is like, like, like I always say investing, like, why this? Like, why this? Like, what is it about uh, Catalyst and about the market opportunity that got you excited, us excited? I know the story, but really, I will say, like, you've been working on impact for a long time, well before you and I crossed paths. And we crossed paths, and I saw, you know, the burgeoning of tech ecosystems all across the country. Saw Salt Lake, and I saw Austin, I saw Bozeman, and but also saw the lack in, or the opportunity for impact. And when you and I started talking and we said, wow, there's something big we can do here together. I'd love for you to start to recount from the kind of the early days of, of what Catalyst was set up to do and what opportunity were you uh, were we pursuing? Yeah, I, I think the real alignment that you and I had initially on this and, and it has been, you know, continued to be there from day one is on this Heartland thesis, which is there are places, you know, like Salt Lake City, um, although Salt Lake has been you know, much more discovered in the last five years, you know, uh, since we first started talking about this, but places like Salt Lake City, like Austin and others um, that historically had been, you know, off the radar of institutional capital that are really fantastic places to invest. Um, and, and, you know, going into those markets and looking for, you know, signals of demand, you know, diversified economies, really, really healthy um, you know, ecosystems for investment and finding opportunities to invest in those ecosystems. That that was really the um, sort of genesis for this. And, and that has really sort of borne itself out with Catalyst. We've raised about $300 million. We're in about 10 of these markets now around the country, mostly in the Midwest, the Intermountain West, and some in the Pacific Northwest. And the basic thesis is that we're finding, um, you know, markets that have Again, sort of diversified economies, good demand drivers, you know, good growth signals, but then finding neighborhoods. I, sh I should say that this is a real estate investment fund. We're specifically targeting uh, real estate as an asset class, but finding within those markets neighborhoods that have historically been shut out of investment. And those neighborhoods can be right adjacent to the downtown, you know, financial district or the big research university or the hospital campus or whatever it is. 
Um, but just being that close, um, they could still be dilapidated and really suffering from um, you know, disinvestment. Our capital goes into those neighborhoods. The reason the name of the firm is Catalyst is we think that our capital can be catalytic to creating kind of transformational you know, change in those neighborhoods. And we've now, in the five years we've been doing this, we've seen this happen in 10 different cities across the country. Um, the building I'm sitting in right here in Salt Lake is actually our first investment out of our first fund um, near downtown Salt Lake. It's an old warehouse and industrial district, really, really rough neighborhood. When we first came in, we did an adaptive reuse kind of office building here that I'm sitting in now that's been wildly successful. And that just that just triggered a series of follow on investments from our funds, from other folks. We have now a billion and a half dollars of investment that have come into this neighborhood around this specific asset because we really wanted to plant that flag and say, this neighborhood's cool. It's got all the right ingredients to be successful and, and it's gonna happen. And, and, and then the success has come um, on the heels of that. So it's, it's been a really fun thesis. I also just say really quickly, um, you know, unlike probably a lot of the folks that you talk with um, on this series, you know, real estate's a little bit of a different asset class. What, the, what I think is interesting about real estate is it becomes the built environment or the infrastructure that houses businesses, that houses, you know, interesting sort of services and amenities and infrastructure in these communities. So it's, it's really sort of a, you know, a portal or a lens through which you can sort of look and understand and, and really have an impact on a community. So it's a pretty exciting asset class. I'm, I really love that you made that connection because there's kind of two sides of that coin, right? So... <clears throat> If there's like you're catalyzing, catalyzing growth. So there has to be some growth, some momentum, some momentum. And, and then you catalyze and like keep it going and keep it progressing. So like at One America Works, we've looked at the fastest growing kind of tech eco uh, hub, tech hubs. And there's kind of four dimensions, you know, talent. Do you have the talent? Can you attract the talent? Can you retain the talent? Um, connectivity, how connected is a place to the innovation ecosystem? Um, capital, all these sorts of things. And then the two others are quality of life, right? And cost. And so much of uh, of a city, of a place, right? Catalyst is in the place business. You get a little spark and some entrepreneur starts a business, starts hiring, and then starts growing. How long before that place starts to outgrow its quality of life, its cost, mm -hmm. How fast before the people that made the place cool, the teachers, the firefighters, the artists starting getting pushed out. And I remember you and I really jamming on this early to say, we know there's some places that are going to be successful. Salt Lake, Bozeman, Nashville, places. And we also knew that if we didn't catalyze that investment, then the things that made them cool and interesting wouldn't survive. And then also, I'd love for you to talk more about impact because I don't think enough people talk about impact when they're talking about heartland investing and the interior growth, because the communities that were there before the tech workers or the tech workers became capitalized, they're an important and special part of these, these communities. And to the extent we can create ladders so they can stay close to the job, so they can walk across the street or take a local bus or their kids can go to school in the neighborhood where this wealth is being created. I, I know that's important to you. And I wouldn't mind, it would be great if you just shared some of that um, insight with the audience. Yeah, I, I think um, I think it's really interesting, and it's funny because five years ago, um, you know, when I when you and I first started talking about this, um, you know, we were projecting out some of these problems that that could potentially you know hit some of these communities, you know, victims of their own success, if you will. And I really like your four criteria. I think that's I think that's right. Um, and 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 now five years later, we've seen a lot of that actually manifest itself. Salt Lake's a great example. Austin, maybe the best example in the country, where um, you know the affordability crisis has um, you know taken hold in some of these communities, and that that very demographic that you're talking about, you know the the sort of creative class, the bank tellers, the cops, the nurses, the teachers, the real backbone of the workforce. These are folks that can no longer afford to live in their own community. Um, and again, when we first started out, that was true in a few of the places that we were looking out and we were looking at now categorically across the board, every community we're talking to, we're working in, um, the affordability crisis is top of mind for folks. So I would just, I would sort of lead with that and the built environment again, through investment in real estate is a really interesting way to sort of attack and, and, and try to address that problem. 
we've really um, a catalyst, you know, sort of uh, converged on a workforce attainable or, or workforce housing strategy in the real estate that we develop and, and invest in, which is really providing housing for the, you know, call it the backbone of the workforce in a local community. Um, we think that's right, a missing middle, right? That's another term that's well used these days, missing middle. That's right. Yeah, you'll hear that missing middle um, term now and again. And, and, and really what you're getting at is like, is, is a community healthy enough to be able to house the people that actually live, I'm sorry, that, that actually work in that community. And increasingly, this really started with like ski resort communities. It was like, you know, lift workers had to start commuting because they couldn't live there. And then now this has basically gone everywhere. And, you know, cities like Salt Lake, the people that actually work in the bars and the restaurants and the banks and whatever, that they're, you know, they're having to live, you know, way outside the city. So it, it's it's really an acute problem. Um, we're fixated on it, focused on it. We have some interesting, you know, capital strategies, interesting partnerships with um, local developers, local governments that allow us to deliver, you know, housing at that at that workforce, um, you know, price point, which is, uh, you know, which is really important for us. To, to your point about, you know, impact more broadly, you know, we think about four big buckets of impact in the work that we do. One is housing affordability. That's definitely a big one. Um, another is access to services. So, you know, what, what aren't, you know, what services and amenities aren't being programmed or delivered in these communities that really make for a healthy, balanced, you know, happy place to live? Um, and how does the real estate that we're investing in and developing, how does it plug those kind of amenity and service gaps? Um, and there's a whole bunch of, you know, great stories out of the out of the portfolio we could talk about there. Um, the third category is how does the built environment support small business creation, you know, local entrepreneurs getting businesses off the ground? Can you program workforce training facilities into your, into your uh, buildings, et cetera? And then the fourth is environmental sustainability. Um, the, you know, the, the carbon footprint of the commercial real estate sector is one of the bigger categories of, of you know, carbon output in the world. And, and if you can sort of you know, address that issue in housing and you know, office real estate, you can, you can have a big impact. So to your point, we think about impact pretty holistically. Um, we, we do something that I think is pretty differentiated. We actually measure... Um, in, a, in a pretty rigorous way, the, the impact that we think we're going to have in a community in kind of a pre-investment underwriting context, and then on a post-investment kind of asset management context going forward, we go back and measure how our investment is positively impacting that community in a very kind of objective, you know, uh, you know, numer you know quantitative way, um, because we're, we're really serious about understanding, you know, what it is that we're doing. You know, yeah, what, I love what the, the discipline of the measurement, Jeremy, because I know in the underwriting, then as you're picking developers and finding partners, if you're serious and very clear up front, some developers aren't buying into that, right? You know, here's the measures. You're going to hold them accountable or, or not hold them accountable, partner with delivering those and you find the right teams that want to deliver on those. And I, I know that's important from the beginning of the underwriting process. So that's something that Catalyst is doing very different. Um, could you kind of, so you mentioned the 1.5 billion of invested. Could you just kind of do a quick snapshot of, it's such an impressive impact study, like how much housing, like what are the metrics of success that uh, that Catalyst has achieved so far in just five years? Yeah, we, we just put out our um, kind of first annual impact report as, as a firm. We, we had done kind of periodic and, and piecemeal things. But we finally kind of consolidated that into an annual report that we just put out. Um, and, and there's some really interesting things we have now, you know, several thousands of units of affordable housing. That's, that's a big metric. Um, you know, we track things in some of our commercial properties where we have, you know, office and retail space. We actually track the number of square feet that we make available to social enterprises or nonprofits that are, you know, programming, you know, neighborhood services or community services in our building. That's, I can't remember the number, but several hundred thousand square feet, um, that we make available, um, we've created, you know, helped to create several thousand new jobs through the, the investments that we've made, meaning the buildings that we've built, including the one that I'm sitting in now that houses a lot of, you know, kind of different um, small businesses that are growing in this community. Those folks have created a lot of new jobs in this community. We've helped capture that growth, incubate that growth and give it a place um, by creating, you know, sort of infrastructure for that growth. 
And, and also everything that we do on the business, small business side is with a view to kind of accommodating the future growth of small business. So mm -hmm. for example, the building I'm sitting in right now, we have, you know, suites in here that accommodate like a two person startup, kind of a garage, you know, concept startup um, all the way to a hundred thousand square feet and everything in between. And we've been able to, in a lot of cases, you know, take a company that started in that two person, you know, garage effectively and sort of work them through. I think some of them are up to now 10, 15,000 square feet of space. Mm -hmm. We're really committed to, you know, going through that sort of life cycle with the, you know, with the tech founders and the entrepreneurs that we, um, that we host. Um, and, then, and then the housing is obviously a big part of that as well, because, you know, you'll hear, I'm sure, from a lot of your um, tech company CEOs and founders that, you know, getting the workforce to have places to live, you know, reasonably, you know, proximate to where they, to where they work is a huge need. And we're providing sort of urban infill opportunities for people to live in places that they also work. It'd be helpful maybe to cut, to, to do a case study, maybe like Minneapolis or Tacoma or one of the other places. Yeah. So yeah, maybe a quick um, quick case study in Minneapolis because I think this is so um, this is so timely. And we actually, the New York Times reached out to me the other day to ask about this, and it looks like they may actually report on this. Um, but our, our developer partner in Minneapolis is an African-American guy um, working in the north side of Minneapolis, which is kind of the, the African-American community there. And um, when George Floyd was killed, he was killed on the south side of Minneapolis. But a lot of the rioting and, you know, sort of damage took place in this guy's neighborhood in Minneapolis. And he's a developer there. He, um, he decided that he wanted to sort of jump in and try to help rebuild his neighborhood. And went through a lot of hard work with the city, the county, and the state to get grants in place. He got a 40-year fixed rate loan from HUD, um, very attractive financing. And we came in as an equity partner and have now built a 150-unit um, um, workforce affordable housing project in North Minneapolis, which is really the first new um, you know, investment in multifamily housing in that neighborhood in like 30 or 40 years. There's a lot of deeply affordable housing that's come online in that neighborhood for really, really, you know, marginal folks. What our developer said is, that's great. We need lots of that. But we also need places for folks who have jobs, who are upwardly mobile in this neighborhood, yeah. who have no place to, to live and otherwise just have to leave the neighborhood. Um, I want a place for those folks to put down their roots and, and anchor in this community. This is a guy, by the way, who raised his family in this neighborhood. His kids are now raising their families, um, you know, in the neighborhood. So deep, deep commitment to place. Um, but that'll be the first project in about 40 years that'll provide housing for folks who have jobs in that community that want to stay and build in North Minneapolis. Yeah, I just want to just like pause for a second. and say It's so easy, particularly say real estate, to just go to the places that are so obvious. You know, go build another condo tower in Miami you know, wherever, there's a lot of places and nothing wrong with Miami. It's great. It's, but it's pretty, pretty straightforward real estate hunting and building and developing. But the story that you just told takes, you know, vision, it takes commitment and it, it takes a set of investors and a team that's actually going to go and spot this and then make that commitment. And you're building 150 units on a big portfolio. That's probably not huge, but for this community, it's a massive impact. And that's, I think, really differentiates the values that catalysts are operating with. And by the way, creating excellent returns for investors along the way, which is kind of the under story of, of this type of investment. It's not like you can't, you know, find, you know, you know, great investments in places like Minneapolis on the North side. They're just overlooked because everybody's just going to where the puck is. So I just love that story. That's such a good one. Yeah. I mean, I agree completely. We, we figure there's lots of capital chasing deals in Miami and New York and San Francisco. Like we don't need to be one more, you know, investment fund in those markets, but, um, but yeah, we're, we're, we're trying to find diamonds in the rough, if you will. And we found those in Minneapolis, Bozeman, Salt Lake, and, and a lot of places like that. So let's, so let, let's switch gears a little bit. Cause we've talked about the success of raising over nearly 300 million, deploying about a billion of, of like of, of built infrastructure, thousands of units. But five years ago, Catalyst was a startup. And I'd love to just take us all the way back there. I remember the first spreadsheet 
trying to, you know, figure it out, you know, getting that first half million dollars of capital to fund the GP, trying to get that first investor to, you know, you know, put the first, you know, non-founder money into, into the, uh, into the project. And first time founder, first time, uh, in, uh, in first time fund, I guess was the biggest hurdle, right? So, you want to take us all the way back there and talk a little bit about what it's like to start a fund with a thesis like this? Yeah, for sure. And, and I'll never forget, Patrick, you and I working through the business plan um, and, and me sort of submitting the first draft of my business plan, which was really just, you know, fleshing out the, the bullets that you had given me over, over lunch or dinner one time and, and getting a lot of feedback from you on that, on that first business plan. But yeah, like, you know, really steep learning curve. Um, to your point in investment, um, investment management, asset management, the, the mantra that you'll hear from asset owners and allocators is, well, you know, what's the track record? You know, what does your realized track record look like? And so there's this real sort of incumbency advantage, you know, folks that have been out there, they're on their sixth or seventh fund, they've got, you know, tons of track record they can point to. For a first time fund, even you know where you have guys that have been out there and been successful in different ventures in their own right, um, you know capital allocators will look at that and will just say, well, I, you know I got to have, I got to have track record, um, and I, I think we were able to overcome that. Um, so that that was I think by far the biggest hurdle we faced. I think we were by and large able to overcome that because we really hit the thesis, um, and and the strategy was good, and I think people. And, and obviously the team had to be good. It had to make sense from that perspective. And we really, by the way, quickly built up a very institutional team that we're, that we're super proud of. But, um, but the strategy just, it sounded right. It sounded authentic. And these were markets, to your point, and to the whole thesis of One American Works, these are markets that people wanted to get into. Salt Lake, Nashville, places like that. They didn't have exposure. They could see the growth story. Um, and so we were able to take advantage of that and um, and really leverage a lot of capital into the into the strategy early on. I'll, I'll never forget, by the way, you know, the, the first time we closed on five million dollars, the first five million dollars in the fund. And it was like high fives all around, like, you know, oh, my God, this is real people actually are going to put money with us. Yeah, so somebody who's not who, who's not related to us is going to put some money into it and let us trust trust us to deploy it for them over a 10 year period. Yes, that is a that is right. a big commitment. Uh, so I guess I was going to say, what's the like aha moment? You just shared it with us. The first like customer, basically, in this case, is an investor who puts a, a real amount of money into the thesis and trusts uh, trust the team to uh, deploy that and manage that capital over a very long period of time. That is, it's a good example. So um, there's the real quick on this one because I always, when I'm investing, I always think of four big questions like. Why this? Why now? Like, why is this a problem? Why is now the time to do it? Um, the third question is, why you? And the fourth question is like, why here? We've talked about the first two and the fourth one, but why you? Like, wh why are you so inspired to commit at least 10, probably closer to 15 or more years to this problem in this way? Yeah, so I... You know, I've been in impact investing for most of my career. Um, our, our other co-founder, third partner, um, Jim Sorensen, is, is a huge name in impact investing. Um, he's, a, he's an ultra high net worth guy himself. He has no reason to want to kind of manage anybody else's money. Um, he's got plenty to do on his own account. Um, but the reason that I think the three of us all got into this is we were inspired by, um, you know, the mission and the opportunity to put capital to work in these kinds of, you know, markets and, the, and in these kind of neighborhoods. And to your point, there, there are probably easier strategies out there that we could have executed on. But I think, you know, none of us were in a position where we wanted, none of us were in a position in our careers where we wanted to take the easy road. We were more interested in, you know, kind of legacy, um, you know, legacy opportunities to, um, you know, marry up our passion with our career and, and really put capital to work in a way that, um, that manifested that. That to me is, is what gets me excited about Catalyst every day that I wake up. And, and again, I, I come back to real estate just being a really, really interesting place to, um, to invest dollars because it's, it's, it's physical infrastructure and it houses all sorts of interesting things in these communities. And as a result of the work that we're doing, by the way, I've gotten to know about all sorts of 
you know, service delivery models, you know, tech models. We have robotics companies that I've learned about as tenants. It's just an interesting sort of view into the world. Um, but I, th I think it's our background in kind of impact investing and investing in these kinds of communities through a lot of the work that you've done, Jim's work, my background. And then, and then I, I think if that grit by itself, that wouldn't be sufficient, sufficient. It was building a team around us that brought that kind of institutional asset management expertise from places like Goldman and Fortress and CIM and some of the other kind of household name shops. We attracted a lot of that kind of talent and poached talent from those firms aggressively. Um, and, and those folks came over because they were interested in, again, the mission and purpose of what we were doing. They wanted to be in these small markets. They'd been in New York. They'd been in San Francisco. They thought the real growth opportunity you know, in the future was in places like Bozeman and Nashville. And so we, we did extremely well in the talent race and brought over an incredible um, you know, group of folks that have helped us execute on this at the most institutional, you know, level. So mid-market firm focused on, you know, kind of tertiary and secondary markets around the country, but bringing, um, you know, the best talent in the country to that. It, it really highlights this, this other point that we talk a lot about with When America Works is called the trust network. And, you know, you were just describing the talent that Catalyst has been able to attract Talent in meaning that they have like world-class networks in themselves, world-class work experience, and they know people and they know how to do things. And the capital is also national. I don't know how international the capital is, but it's very national. And when we use the built infrastructure of building and making these investments, it's bringing capital partners around and be like, well, Minneapolis, Tacoma, these are places I hadn't thought of, but now I oh, I'm getting a good return, or wow, I didn't know that growth was there, or the team coming from places and they're bringing that expertise and leveling up everybody in the market to underwrite things in a more sophisticated way, create the return. So I think that real estate is kind of an undersung uh, part of the ecosystem that makes these places successful. It's not just the cost. It's like, where do people collaborate? Where do they live? Where do they sit? And who's involved? And, you know, you know, what does it mean to the rest of the world that investors from San Francisco, LA, New York, Miami, all these places are now making capital commitments over a 10 or 15 year years to these places. And so they're going to be keeping track of them, which then brings more attention. So I think that <clears throat> that last point you are making about people buying into the vision is a really big part of the success. And I just want to like pause on that because it's so cool. The, the last questions we're wrapping up and um, is uh, it's, it's a fun question. And, and I know you have this, and I'm not sure which one you're going to have because you have been the managing partner for this through COVID, through regulatory changes, through every single thing that could get thrown at an entrepreneur has been thrown at you. And so I, I just want to ask you, like, after all these years of doing this and with the like serious success that we just talked about, what is your superpower? What's the thing that has given you the ability to overcome all these challenges and achieve this success? Um, yeah, it's interesting. And, and, you know, obviously you and your network appreciate this, but I, you know, as a, as an entrepreneur, you quickly learn that, um, you know, the beginning stages of a new venture are really fun and exciting because it's new and fun and exciting. And then, and then you get to the really hard part where it's like, okay, now I got to execute and, and grind through things. And, and you inevitably come up against these brick walls. I'm, I'm sitting in front of a brick wall, so that's appropriate. Um, where you're just like, you know, you go home and you're like pulling your hair out going like, that's it, we're done. Like there's no, how could you possibly get past this? And I, I think my superpower is a ton of elbow grease and just, you know, a willingness to get up that next morning. I may, I may not be in the frame of mind that night. I may go to bed totally depressed <laughs> and miserable, but chances are I'm going to wake up that next morning and go, there's got to be a way around this. And if we work hard at, you know, work hard enough at it and um, are innovative and open to sort of thinking outside the box, there's got to be a way around this. And, and I can probably point to five or 10 things just with Catalyst and with other ventures I've done in the past where that's been exactly the formula. And I think where people really run into, um, you know, hard time with, with stuff like this is they, they hit that brick wall and then it's just like, you know what, this isn't going to work. I'm going to go back and do the more conventional thing. And, and that's sort of the easy way out. But I, but I do think, 
you know, sticking with it, perseverance, a lot of elbow grease, and uh, and being willing to think outside the box that that can pay dividends in a in a big big way. Right. So I'm going to just capture it. Jeremy Keel, superpower, pushing through. <laughs> I really think that's it. I just Jeremy Keel and superpower in the same sentence is just just laughable. So I, I, I just I'm just going to laugh whenever you say that. Um, but I appreciate that. That's nice. Well, um, I just want to thank you for spending some time with uh, with us in the audience today. Congratulations on all the success. I'm proud of everything that we've done together to this point and what's going to happen in the future because uh, this important work and you know showing others that uh, they can also come in and invest and do impact investing well and make great returns and find you know meaningful and valuable projects is really the light and the beacon that Catalyst, I think, has come to represent. So I want to thank you for that and thank you again for joining us. Thanks, Patrick. Thanks for all the good work you're doing. And uh, One America Works in particular, come, come see us in Salt Lake, come do an event in, uh, in Salt Lake. We'd love, to, we'd love to host you guys. But yeah, thanks, thanks for having me and for all the great work you're doing as well. Really appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thank you.